Hi, how are you doing? Thank you so much for allowing us to communicate with you, to chat with you, to be in your space wherever you are at today. Maybe you're here, you're watching this, you're carrying some sort of burden in your heart about your family, about all kinds of stuff all around you. Today, before we go into the service, I'd like to pray with you. I want to bring all these needs before God and we're going to trust God together that He is a God who is kind and faithful and He listens to us when we pray. So, would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we bring to you our families, we bring to you our worries and our anxiety about, about our lives, about our future, about our finances, about our business, about all kinds of things. God, I thank you that you are a God of comfort and you're a God who is present right here, right now with us. Bring healing into our family, bring healing into our hearts, bring healing into our, our physical body for those of us who are sick. We trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi again. Right now we're gonna take some time to give our tithes and our offering. We know that for a lot of us this time has been a time of financial stress and financial anxiety. And as a church, we are actually amazed of how many people during this time have joined in in this journey of giving. We're amazed of the type of people that gives. It's ranging up from rich people, poor people, normal people, just like you and like me, making a difference together. And this is our encouragement to a lot of you that has been giving um, from 2 Corinthians 9. And this is what we're trusting God for, for all of us. And God will, will generously provide all you need as you give. Then you will always everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. That's what we're trusting God for as a church, that, that we will have all that we need with a lot of leftovers for us to be able to be a generous church. So thank you so much for joining us in this journey of giving. Thank you so much for making a difference together. All the giving details are on the screen. If you're joining us in person today, hi to you. I'm there right there in the front row saying hi to you. Um, the Hello Crew, one of the Hello Crew will, will walk around with the giving container if you'd like to give via cash. And there's a cart machine at the Hello Desk as well if you are joining us in person today. We love you guys. Thank you for being a generous church. family and I save Jesus by attending to people's electrical problems. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for allowing us to come into your home. We treat this as, a, as an honor and privilege. And we pray that God will help us to be the blessing to you that we long to be. May God bless each one of you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as I speak about mourning this morning, may something shift in our hearts and in our world. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are. We are in person and online. And this service that is being recorded now I'm going to be preaching the same sermon on Sunday morning. And 
uh, and but the, the service will have a different atmosphere just because it's it's different, a different medium. But thank you for being with us, as I've said, and let's let's get going. I'm speaking on the matter of loss and the matter of grief and the matter of mourning. Earlier on, Tamsin read Psalm 3. It was a psalm that was written by David when he was fleeing his son Absalom. He was a, a, a traitor and he was fleeing for his life, was David. And he wrote these words. He said, I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn up on every side. Arise, O Lord, deliver me. And he, say, he says this, to the Lord I cry aloud, and he answers me from his holy hill. And what do you write when you're in your low spot? What do you write down when you're feeling besieged and worst of all, when you're feeling betrayed? Have you ever felt betrayed? David knew what it was like to be betrayed, just as Jesus knew what it was like to be betrayed. My scripture verse for this morning though, is Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4. Matthew 5, 4. You can read it on the screen. Strange words and a strange point of view. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. That's what it says in the NIV version. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed means more than being happy. The word happy has as its root the word hap, happenstance, uh, chance. Happiness depends on an environment. I don't know who of you are old enough to remember the Peter Stuyvesant cigarette adverts where you'd see people skiing in the Alps or you'd see people skiing uh, on, the, on, the, on the ocean somewhere in the Bahamas. And the message there was that the people who smoke Peter Stuyvesant cigarettes, they're living the good life. And their tagline for their cigarette was, the world at play. The world at play. Uh, but blessed isn't that. It doesn't depend on your environment. You don't need the Bahamas or, or the ski slopes of Aspen in order to be, to be blessed or happy. You don't need to be at play in order to be happy. And one thing that we want to avoid with all of our energy, all of our being, is we want to avoid unhappiness. We don't want to be unhappy. We shun mourning outside of the church and inside of the church. People find it uncomfortable when they are speaking to someone who is in a place of mourning. They don't know how to deal with it. They say, I don't know what to say. Or they say, phone me if you, if you need anything. But the phone call never comes, of course. Um, compassion is reaching out to people who don't have the strength to reach out to you. And if somebody is mourning, reach out to them and put yourself in their space. Uh, that's, that's, that's the most helpful. Happiness. Blessed. Blessed is not happiness. Um, entertainment is escape. It's escaping. The world says forget your sorrows. That's the goal. But mourning has a role in our lives. And mourning also has a role in our theology. The church at large has embraced a triumphalistic theology, which says win, 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 God's in charge, you're a victor, everything will go well with your life. And that's the deal. That's a false message. Because we have a place of mourning. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Um, to put it upside down, Luke 6.25, the parallel passage, he puts it upside down. He says, Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. And I'm not saying that uh, to be miserable is to be spiritual. I'm not saying that to be spiritual is to, is to be miserable. Um, the older son objected to the sound of music and dancing. We don't want to be in the tradition of the older son. We want to be in the tradition of the younger son, the returning son. But when a person is in a place of mourning, something happens in their life that doesn't happen otherwise. My method today is to just 
It'll be like a, a jigsaw. You know when you have a jigsaw puzzle, you take all the pieces out of the box, and then you turn them all the way right side up, then you get the straight edges, then you see what fits with what. It's going to be a little bit like that. I'm going to turn pieces over, and then we're going to see how those pieces fit together. So bear with me. I'm going somewhere with this. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, the NIV says. The good news for modern man says, happy are those who mourn. God will comfort them. The Living Bible says, mourning people are fortunate. They will be comforted. The New Living Translation says, God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The message puts it beautifully. It says, you're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you embrace the one most dear to you. My point in going through all those things is they all say exactly the same thing. It's not, aha, uh -huh, no, it, it means actually something different. It means exactly what it says. When you mourn, you are blessed by God. Jeff's version, I don't know if you knew there was a Jeff's version. It says, it says this, when you experience loss and sorrow, you catch God's attention and he will bring you the strengthening and the healing that you need. There's something about a mourning heart that gets God's attention. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Clearly, there is a time when we, when we feel lost. Clearly, there is a place for mourning in our lives as believers in a good God. Moreover, uh, clearly, it is God himself who comforts us. Sometimes we expect comfort from places that can't provide comfort. Sometimes we search for comfort where, we, where comfort isn't to be found. When people set out to comfort, they have excellent intentions, but often they don't succeed in providing comfort. You see, people resort to platitudes. What's a platitude? It's saying something, a well-worn thing that's just become meaningless. It's been said, so uh, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. That's a platitude. What's it actually mean? Nothing. Um, a, 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 another, another one is uh, uh, winners don't quit and quitters don't win. What's that mean? Not particularly helpful. And here's a platitude. So sometimes when someone's suffering this, they're smiling down at heaven from you. Ha! Ah, well, if they're smiling down from heaven, why did they not keep up the payment on the policy? And why did they not leave the, the internet code behind? That would have been useful. Don't smile at me from heaven. People feel like that. And they're not comforted by, by empty thoughts. Sometimes they resort to equivalence. And you mourning because you've lost someone, you say, now I remember when my granny died and they compare your loss with, with, with their loss. When we are mourning, we need to have the comfort that comes from God. God provides comfort. People can provide certain comfort, but we are all fallen, stumbling, and inadequate in our approaches. So we need to have compassion on each other. But God does provide us with comfort. How things work in God's kingdom, I'm going on, turning over another piece. How things work in God's kingdom. Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7 is called the Sermon on the Mount. It's been called the Constitution and Bylaws of the Kingdom of Heaven. It shows how the thing works. Um, uh, Jesus sent out the 72, saying, Say to them, Heal the sick, cast out demons, and say this, the kingdom of heaven is drawn close to you. This is, what, this is the look and feel of heaven that you're experiencing. <coughs> Excuse me. The kingdom of heaven has come close to you. That's how it looks and how it feels. It was called the gospel of the kingdom. And so Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he says what the, what the kingdom actually looks like. And so mourning is a part of the kingdom of heaven. When you go to London, you've got to discover how London works. And so you want to go on the tube, and they, the tubes, they're long, and they've got these long escalators that go down. You go down on these escalators, rolling steps. And the way things work in London is you stand left and you pass right. Because some people are in a big hurry. 
And if you stand, ne- if I stood next to Wendy, I'd get an earful. I had to stand behind Wendy to get people a chance, to get past me. Even when I was carrying those big suitcases, I had to let people get past me. I had to discover how it worked in London. In Russia, they were so kind to us, uh, were the Peshagas. And so they would book a train ticket on a high-speed train, and the train would leave at 8 o'clock in the morning. But they would send the bus, the church bus, ahead of us, and that driver would leave here in the previous night, and he'd drive through the night. So that when the, the, when the train arrived at 11 o'clock the next morning, the bus was there waiting to pick us up to take us to, the, to our next destination. And we didn't have to wait or take public transport or, or anything like that. But we discovered that the coach you're sitting on is important because not every coach opens on every station. And so if you pull into a station and you want to get off there and you're in the wrong coach, you can't open the doors. You got to, I don't know, you find out these things, um, especially when their writing is different to our writing. But you've got to find out the way the thing works. And you've got to find out the way the kingdom of heaven works, the, the, the way it is. So it is how things work. When you are mourning, something special is going to happen in your life. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. To give a different emphasis. Let's turn over another piece. The matter of loss. I chose this subject to speak to you now because we've gone through a period of great loss in our society, and in our lives. This last year has been a year we're at on the anniversary. This year has been a year of loss. What have we lost? Well, we've lost the comfort of, of family and friends. We've lost job security. We've lost businesses. We've got people in the church. They've lost their businesses. They've lost their future and their prosperity. We've lost predictability. We don't know what's going to happen next. We don't know if a third wave is coming. We're all going, whoa, what's coming next? Um, We've lost a sense of well-being. What's the future hold for me and for mine? Uh, There's been a significant drop in GDP, I think about 7%, they said. So we all are, are poorer. Uh, in, in material terms now than we were a year ago. A, a year ago, Change brings a sense of loss, and things have certainly changed at a hectic pace. Things have changed for children. Things have changed for the way schools operate. Things have changed to education online. Uh, Zoom has become a feature of our life. Um, uh, arts and culture, no more live music. When last did you sit down in a restaurant and listen to live music and enjoy a meal? It's wonderful to do that. When last did you do that? Okay, let's change that. Let's change it up. When last did you sit in a full restaurant with the vibe and the clink and the, and, and, and the energy that a full room brings? Uh, you go to a spur now. It's empty. And, and spurs, that landmark spur, is, is teetering on the brink of, 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 of collapse. A landmark uh, franchises are, are we feeling lost uh, there. Libraries, no hugging. Our world and our society has shifted, and we feel are feeling lost. This brings mourning. So we've all lost something. But even worse than that, some amongst us have lost someone. They've lost someone that, that they weren't even able to say goodbye to. And, and so there, there is that as an aspect as well. So what I'm saying is pertinent to every single one of us. We've suffered loss to some or another degree. Some have suffered catastrophic loss, and some have just has a, have a sense of loss. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Turn over another piece of the puzzle. What about the broken heart? What can I say about the broken heart? When Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, he chose the strongest word for mourning that was available in the Greek language. It was a word that was used for mourning the dead. It was a word that was used for 
being at the death's bedside of someone. The type of mourning that David did when he heard the news that his son Absalom had died, that haunting cry, Absalom, my son, my son. Absalom, I wish it was me that was dead rather than you. That's the word of mourning that is used there. Haunting cries. The word is used uh, for the lamenting in Judah of all the mothers after their, after their children, three years and younger, the, all the boys under, three years and under, killed by that tyrant Herod. There was wailing in Bethlehem. There was wailing in the streets. There was wailing in the houses. You could not walk down the streets and know something terrible had happened. That's the word that is used for mourning. It's the word that is used for, for Jesus when he mourned over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. It was a deep, passionate cry that could not be hidden, the grief that cannot be hidden. In the Old Testament, in the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, it's the same, the same word that is used for, 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 for Jacob when he hears that his son Joseph has died and he's shown these blood-spattered, torn clothes, and he cries, his favorite son, he's the one who brought him comfort, that one, that's the word that's used. So Jesus is not saying, for those who are feeling that it's a little bit of a blue day, no, he's talking about people for whom it is intense mourning. He says, those people are blessed because they will be, they will, they will be comforted. And so Jesus is saying, blessed is the one who mourns as though mourning for the dead. Blessed is the person who has endured the most bitter sorrow life can bring. Talk more about the broken heart. Mourning. Let's turn over another piece that fits in with that piece. <coughs> Excuse me, see if it fits in the picture. Let's, let's try and to understand mourning. What's the opposite of mourning? It's, it helps to understand something, to see what it's not, to see the opposite of what it is. And so instead of saying, what is it, say, what isn't it? What's the opposite of mourning? The opposite of mourning is not happy, and it's not lighthearted. The opposite of mourning is self-satisfied. Did you get that? The opposite of mourning is self satisfied. All is well with me and I am fine. The opposite of mourning is the voice of the man who says, I thank you that I'm not like other men are. The voice of mourning is the voice of the man who says, God have mercy on me, a sinner. That is, there you can see what mourning is by seeing what is what it's opposite what it's opposite um, it's the voice that says even though they all leave you i will never leave you when peter who spoke those words went out after his denying of the lord and wept bitterly he was not on the way out from the kingdom he was on the way back into the kingdom at that point when he said i'm not like the others and i'll never leave you he was on the way out of the kingdom. You see, blessed are those who mourn. They uh, will, be, will, will be comforted. The broken heart and the mourning heart is the opposite of the self-satisfied heart. The, the opposite of the mourning heart is the older brother heart who says, the son of yours. The mourning heart is the heart that says, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That is the true mourning. That heart is comforted. Another piece that we can turn over. There are lessons that you don't learn in a place of prosperity, peace, and self-satisfaction. Things such as the kindness of human beings, Things such as the compassion of God. Things such as the comfort of God. The comfortable person can live on the surface for a very 
long time. The morning person makes true contact with God. An absence of mourning makes me callous. It makes me hard-hearted. Blessed are those who are desperately sorry about the suffering in the world. The comfortable person avoids who avoids the uncomfortable things in life lives a small life. I saw last week an interview on Al Jazeera of a woman who was traveling through Afghanistan in a convoy of Toyota Land Cruiser vehicles. And they stopped and a, and a, and a crowd of women gathered around. And she was a blonde European woman and a Scandinavian, she looked to me. And she described how a woman stepped out of the crowd of women with a little baby and put it in her arms, put it into her arms and take it, take it. And the woman was clearly wanting her to take the baby to give the baby a better chance in life. And the driver came out and he rudely and forcefully pushed the mother away so that she went stumbling into the dust. And afterwards, when they'd left that place, she said to the driver, why did you react so harshly with that woman? He said, because the baby was a girl. There are societies where to be a girl is like a sentence of death. These are things that make our hearts mourn, make our hearts break. The self-satisfied, confined, comfortable bubble, live in a bubble person. They don't receive the comfort of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be, they will, they will be uh, comforted. Lord Shaftesbury, the great English reformer and, and, and churchman, a political reformer, he described where his burden for uh, uh, Victorian England was extremely unjust, cruel, a cruel society, even if it was a successful society. It was very, very hard on children and women. And uh, he said when he was a little child, uh, he saw a child being abused. Uh, physically, and he said, when I grow up, I'm going to give my life to making sure that something like that doesn't happen any longer. Mourning makes you caring. It changes the way that you are, changes the fabric of your life. So blessed is the man who cares about the sufferings and griefs of others. That's something that can be legitimately taken out of those words of Jesus. Or, sorry for the way that I am. That's mourning. I'm sorry that I am me. I had the opportunity to walk around the grounds and the building of the Crystal Cathedral in Los Angeles, Robert Schuller's church. And he had dramatic works of art. If I say dramatic, I mean dramatic works of art in the garden area and in the church foyer. They had a piece that, that haunted me. It was, if you imagine, a, a, a cube of of perspex, it looked like a cube of ice, and maybe two meters by two meters, a large cube. And trapped inside of that, with one arm reaching out, looking for help, was a man. A man was trapped in this cube of ice. There are people who feel that their lives are like that. They are trapped. They're trapped and they're frozen into a, an existence and they don't know how to break out the existence that they are. They are mourning, and they, as they stretch out their hand, it's God who sends his love. It's God who sends his sunshine to melt that ice, to give that person the freedom that they long for, to set that trapped fr prisoner uh, uh, free. No one can repent without a sense of mourning. No one can call on God without a sense of mourning, a sense of sorrow for where I am and what I am, that being frozen into an invisible block of ice. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Mourning is such an important part of our lives. There's the wayward child going on his thoughtless way. Then one day he looks and he sees his father's face and he sees the expression on his father's face and he sees the pain that he is inflicting 
and he's struck inside his heart with a terrible sorrow and something changes there. It's a turning point in his life. That's what mourning does. Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned in your sight and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That is true mourning. This is what the cross does. It shows us what sin does to the innocent. It shows us how ugly sin is. It takes solid relationships and ruins them. It takes a lovely life and it pollutes it. My good, good friend, whose son mercifully has returned, but had a time, a season in his life of addiction, of, of terrible addiction, my friend said to me, I looked at my son and I said to myself, I don't know who that is, but he's not my son. When that son realizes what he's doing, that's what brings mourning to come. We need to be appalled. We need to be outraged at injustice. We need to be appalled at our own state. We need to be desperate about our own condition. When that happens, God's comfort can come. Mourning is the key that opens the cell door that is keeping you a prisoner. You've heard what I've been saying. Has it struck you? Has it hit you? Have you found yourself anywhere described in what I've been saying? Is there mourning in your heart? I want us to pray a prayer of mourning right now. I want us to pray a prayer of penitence right now, where we say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Won't you bow your head together with me? And at the end of this prayer, as you say amen, you will be appropriating that prayer for your own self. Dear Lord Jesus, we coming to you, the God of all comfort, and we say, God, have mercy on us. We trapped in a block of ice. We locked in a cell, and the door is locked. We need to call on you. We are not satisfied with our lives. Have mercy on us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that prayer, you do need to follow up on it. And the way that you follow up is you send a WhatsApp, do it. Don't say, I will, do it. Or go to that card, the digital card, or just send me an email saying what you've done so that we can point you to your next step. God bless you. I hear the Savior say Thy strength indeed is small Child of weakness watch and pray Find in me that all in all Jesus paid it all All to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow But now indeed I find